power and that is void of authority is a religion that will not capture, it will not inflame the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. And I'm troubled today by the presentation of the religious expression of Christendom in America today. It is a presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that is void of real power to change and to transform people's lives. To bring about a positive consequence and a positive change in a community or in a, a neighborhood that seems to be inept and ineffective in reaching people to where they will at least want to know what does the church have to say about something. There used to be a day and time that few things moved in the society unless the church gave its assent, unless the church gave its endorsement to those things moving forward. Even those bastions of higher education that we know now as those Ivy League schools, most of them were established as Christian institutions to train the theologians. Because the founders of this country and those early leaders recognized that we need enlightened, intelligent, spiritual minds in the pulpit. And there was so much respect for the parson or the pastor that it was believed necessary to make sure that they received the best training that they could provide spiritual leadership, but also to be able to speak to the moral issues of the day. Now, anytime someone wants to discuss an issue, very seldom do they invite the church. And very seldom does the church realize that they need to show up and to be that. Because there is a spiritual insight and a spiritual perspective that only those who embrace a Judeo-Christian value can bring to certain situations or circumstances. So our society becomes more secular, which simply means it leaves God out of everything, very often because we simply will not show up and participate in the process. Now, I'm not a politician. I'm not a political wannabe. I'm satisfied with the job that I have, the calling that I have, and the role that God has given to me. But I believe that every citizen in the United States of America ought to be registered to vote. And they ought to pay attention to the issues, ought to wade in where they can, and they certainly ought to exercise the right of franchise to cast their vote. The right to vote is so powerful, that's why there are people now that are trying to figure out a way to marginalize people's enfranchisement. The history of this great republic has been a history of the expansion of the franchise. That's what's made this nation great. This nation does not start out giving everybody the right to vote. That was not the frame of original intent. The franchise was limited to Caucasian males who owned land. They're the only ones that could vote. And it has taken a great effort for the franchise to come to other groups of people. African-American men got the right to the franchise after the Civil War. The 14th Amendment, which basically freed the slave, not the Emancipation Proclamation. The 15th Amendment that gave the equal protection under the law. The 16th Amendment, the right of franchise. Women still didn't have the right to vote. It took the women's suffrage movement in the early 20th century. And it wasn't until the 20s, I believe, that the women got the right to the franchise. That's how powerful the franchise is. People have fought to get the right to the franchise. And so anytime I hear anybody anywhere trying to deny somebody the right to vote, I try to make it hard for someone to vote. That automatically calls my antennas to go up because the United States of America experience has been about the fight and the struggle to expand the franchise and to make sure that every single American citizen would have the right to participate in the political electoral process to elect those people that would lead them. So it's not about politics, it's about recognizing we've got to live down here and that Jesus comes back. And since we do, we have to participate in the education, in the social, in the political, in the economic processes because we have to live with the consequences of the decisions that are made. And if we are not there advocating for what's good and what's right and what's holy and what's just and what's fair, then shame on us if we get treated by like second-class citizens. 
So that's why I try to get you to come out to these meetings because the kids from this neighborhood and community and all over the valley, they're going to live with the consequence of what Kanoa County Schools comes up with in terms of the vision for the reformation, the transformation of the public school system. So if you're not there to advocate for children from our neighborhood and our community, they will not have a voice or representation. And so we will end up with what we have been getting and that which is left over after everything else has been divided. That's just the way it is. And that's what makes a republic such a wonderful place to be. You don't have to have massive weapons of mass destruction. A lot of people, they don't like the political process. I love it. I love the political process. I watched almost all of it on television. I love to hear the speeches. I love to hear the debates. That's the beauty of the democratic republic. It's not the totalitarian regime that reigns. It's not who has all the AK-47s and all the weapons like in other countries, where there are political coups and the government is overthrown by those who have the most military might. Now, in this system, it is about ideas. It is about competing with ideas and trying to influence with ideas and trying to get people to act on ideas. And that's why we must participate in the process. And in so doing, our authority and our power becomes visible to people, and they realize we can do more than cook fried chicken and potato salad for funerals. We can do more than have choirs that can stir and move people, that we can bring consequence to the society because we're trying to do the right thing. And we have no ulterior motive in trying to preserve some political power base. We just want to see the most good done for the most number of people and to eliminate the most amount of pain that we possibly can while we're here on the earth waiting for our change to come. Now, as we read through the Bible, that's why I'm committed to expository preaching because you've got to read through the Bible line by line, verse by verse, to really understand what it actually says. And it's the only way you fully will appreciate the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And the Jesus of Nazareth of the Bible is often unlike the Jesus of Nazareth that we talk about. And we see that in Mark's gospel. And as I shared with you several weeks ago, Mark, this young man Mark, who's credited with writing this gospel, he got much of his information from the apostle Peter, who was an apostle, a close confidant of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Mark felt led by the Holy Spirit to write the good news, the euangelion, the good news about Jesus Christ, and to write it to the Roman world. Matthew had written it to the Jewish world, and that's Matthew's perspective of his gospel. Matthew presents Jesus as the king of the Jews. But Mark recognized that the Roman mind thought differently, and the Roman mind needed to hear a presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that would appeal to them. So Mark feels led by the Holy Spirit to write his gospel, and he's targeting this Roman world, this world of fast-paced movement, this world of action, this world that had the powerfulest army in the world, the greatest economy in the world, this Roman government who could bring consequence anywhere on the face of the known world because their military might and their influence. And Mark says, I'm going to get their attention. To show them that there was this itinerant preacher, Jesus of Nazareth, that would appeal to the Roman mind because he had authority, and not only he had authority, he had power to get things done. So Mark presents Jesus as this authoritarian, powerful preacher, prophet, savior that can bring about change and consequence and make things happen. Now pick up the narrative. After the temptation of Jesus in verses 12 to 13, Mark immediately goes to work, and he sets the context for you. Now, after John was put in prison, that's very important, because we know that John was the forerunner of Jesus, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. It was John who says, I must decrease, he must increase. It was John that said about Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. It was John that says, I'm not the one, but there is coming one after me that is greater than me, whose shoe latches I'm not worthy to unloose. John, this blazing forerunner, has now been arrested by Herod, has been placed in prison, and that is the context. And then Mark says, all the focus now will move away from John toward Jesus. And he has no longer has interference. John was sort of interference with Jesus. The interference is now gone. So now the blunt 
of the resentment and the bitterness and the hatred of the Jewish religious leaders and establishment, it will now turn full force toward Jesus when they recognize he has come to dismantle their corrupt political, economic, and religious system they had in place and to present to them the true kingdom of God. There's a whole lot in that when it says that John was put in prison. I could spend my remaining 26 minutes just talking about that when John was put in prison, but I'm not going to do that. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to work. He came to Galilee, and what did he do? He began to preach. Jesus' authority was anchored in his preaching. He didn't make great suggestions, great recommendations. He said, thus saith the Lord. So his authority was in his preaching. He started to declare the word of God. He started to declare the kingdom of God. He came to Galilee preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. And look at the content of his preaching and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now understand again the context. He's in Nazareth of Galilee. This is a place where there's Jews, there's Gentiles, there's half-breed Jews and Gentiles and Samaritans. This is a place that is not known for its elevated moral lives. As a matter of fact, it was a place of gross immorality. So much so that they were despised and ridiculed by the Jews in the southern part of the kingdom that prided themselves on being the custodians of the law of God and having the temple and being the high moral spiritual people. So Jesus steps into this atmosphere in Nazareth of Galilee and he says, you got to repent. You got to turn away from your lifestyles, turn away from your philosophy, turn away from your worldview. You must repent and believe in the gospel. The message that Jesus heralded almost 2,000 years ago, it is still relevant today. The heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the heart of the good news about Jesus Christ is that men and women, boys and girls, they need to repent. We're not all going to heaven just because we were born. We're only going to get there if we repent. We recognize our need to be saved. We recognize our sinful condition our sinful state, and our sinful actions. We recognize this, and we recognize that we need more than an extreme makeover. We need to be totally changed and transformed, and we recognize that we are corrupt to the core, even the way we think is narcissistic and is self-centered. It is not God-centered. So repentance says you've got to get yourself off of the throne, and you put God on the throne, the center of your world, the center of your universe. So he says, Repent. Turn away. We cannot even hear the gospel until we repent. We can't even hear it until we turn away from what we're doing, what we think, what we think we need to be doing, and say, Lord, I don't even know what to do, where to go, or what to believe. I'm turning to you. That's what repentance is. He says, repent and believe in the good news. Believe that God has provided a way of escape. That God all by himself has provided a way of salvation. And that way will be through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So his authority is established in his preaching. It's not just because I'm a preacher. But it is just because I'm a preacher. <laughs> but I do think that preaching is pretty important. I think it's important in the life of the church. And I think it's what distinguishes the church from the Qantas Club, from the Chamber of Commerce, from all these other social organizations that we recognize and acknowledge that there is a word from God, that God has given us his word and what we know as the Holy Bible. And so that we as the church, we are the custodians, the keepers, we are the trustees of the sacred secrets that's in the scripture. And we're called to herald, to declare, and to make known these hidden secrets and mystery from God's word clearly that people might hear and that they might understand. And so preaching is important, and the church derives its authority from the fact that it is the custodian of the word of God. It is to the church that God has committed the word of the living God, and the church is to, both, to be the teachers of that book, the preachers of that book, the applicators of that book, and presenting what God has said about life, about death, about marriage, about family, about raising children, about economics, about politics, 
about prison system, juvenile justice system, social service system. God has something to say in terms of how people ought and should be treated, regardless of what system they might be in. So his authority is first established in his preaching. The second point I see here in terms of how he establishes his authority, he establishes in it in his calling of how he called people. And he walked by the Sea of Galilee, verse 16, and he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, cast a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, come after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. He demonstrates his authority in how he calls people. He don't, Jesus doesn't care what we're doing. And what we think is important. When he calls us, he expects us to drop what we're doing and to hear and to abide by and to obey and to follow his call. I was listening to a very popular song yesterday, Silver and Gold, Silver and Gold, I'd rather have Jesus than Silver and Gold. And I thought about that. And I said, now, how many people sing that song and just telling a bold-faced lie? Now, if the words would have been silver and gold, silver and gold, I'll take Jesus and silver and gold. <laughs> then we can say it and know we were telling the truth. We want Jesus and the silver and the gold and all the riches that are untold. But very often, we've not contemplated that I would take Jesus rather than silver and gold. But when Jesus calls us, he expects us to abandon our own pursuits to hear what he has to say and to follow what he wants us to do. And very often it will be what we're already doing, but with a different mindset, a different understanding that this is now the platform for the ministry that he's given to us. Sometimes he calls us to radically change and transform our lives, put us on a totally different course, and have us to do something totally different from what we started out doing in the first place. When I was growing up, I was better than Jesse James. Wide Earp could have never caught me. The last thing that I thought that I would become would have been a preacher. The last thing I prepared for was to be a preacher or to be a pastor of a local church. But God in his sovereignty, his providence, he knows. And I was sharing with someone the other day, I said the best training that I could have received for the ministry that God would call me to was the training that I received. I can read all by myself. But the training that God allowed me to get with a great love for science and math and physics and engineering, it trained the mind that was undisciplined. And my training helped to discipline my mind because I believe I suffered from attention deficit disorder and just didn't know it. It helped to train and to discipline the mind. And once the mind is trained and the mind is disciplined, the mind can learn a whole lot of things that you didn't realize that you could learn by observation, by reading, by study. So the training was a very important part of what God would have me to do. So even my community work, it is approached from the standpoint there's a problem. What are you given? What's the formula? What's the equations? How you put things together to fix stuff. So God gives us all training through our lives, and we don't realize that God has trained us through our education, through the way God, uh, God allowed our parents to raise us and rear us, and through our experience to give us a body of experience that God then would use as a reservoir to pour, to engage us to advance his kingdom. So he calls lowly fishermen, not Wall Street tycoons. Not business magnets, he calls lowly fishermen that were unsophisticated and unlearned, but what they did know was they knew the streets. They knew the streets of Nazareth of Galilee. They knew the marketplace. They bought their product, their fish, to the marketplace, and they dealt with people in the real world. They knew how to relate to people. They knew how to bargain. They knew how to persuade people. They had the experience they needed to do what God was calling them to do, and he didn't send them to seminary to get it. Their life experiences had trained them. Now all they needed was his instruction and the Holy Spirit. Then they could become effective. And look at what he says. He says, if you follow me, you've been catching fish. I'm going to teach you how to catch men for God's kingdom. So he had no problem interrupting people's lives and telling them, I have something more important for you to do than what you're currently doing. He's authoritative in his calling. The third way he demonstrates his authority is in his teaching. 
in verse 18, he says, Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the sons of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. So now he has four. He has four. He has two sets of brothers. He has Andrew and Simon, who's called Peter. He has James and John. And these were not exactly the people who graduated from Dale Carnegie School of How to Win Friends and Influence People. As a matter of fact, he calls James and John the sons of thunder. So what that meant, that their daddy was a hellraiser, and they probably were too. They were sons of thunder. They were so bad, as a matter of fact, after Jesus called them, they saw some people casting out demons in Jesus' name. And they said, Lord, can we call down fire out of heaven and consume them? Because they're not with us. <laughs> they're not on our team. These boys were so, so nefarious. They were so clandestine. They were determined to be at the right hand and left hand of Jesus in the kingdom of God. So they recruited their mother brought the mama in to try to convince Jesus to add them to the position of power in his kingdom. Peter, this boy could outcurse any sailor. His vocabulary was, was so broad and vast when it came to cursing. But these are the folk that Jesus called because they had the raw material that was needed. James and John, they got the fire and they got the passion. And they have the zeal to really do something and to move something and to see something happen. Peter is a born leader that can lead people and direct people. And his brother will be his right-hand man. So with authority, he calls these people to follow them. And then he enrolls them to teach them and to instruct them. But watch what Mark does. Mark immediately turns his narrative to say, just so that you don't think that all Jesus did was preach and all he did was taught and all he did have was Bible study and retreats and vacation to Bible school and did all these wonderful things, all these theoretical and philosophical and religious and theological discussions. Mark immediately says, no, he was just like Rome. He had power. Verse 21, then they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath day he entered the synagogue and he taught. And they were astonished. They were blown away. They were mesmerized with his teaching because he taught them as one having what? Authority. Authority. Authority is from the Greek word exousia, and exousia means the right to do something. He had the divine right to teach, and he taught with authority. He taught as if I wrote the book myself because he did write the book. So his authority is demonstrated as his teaching. He taught with authority authority, and they recognized his authority with which he taught, and therefore his teaching had power. So his thought is demonstrated in his preaching, it's demonstrated in his calling, it's demonstrated in his teaching, and then lastly, his authority is demonstrated in his capacity to bring about deliverance, to bring about deliverance. Now watch this. They had been having synagogue school and Bible school and Bible lessons every, Sunday, every Saturday at the synagogue, right? Every Saturday before Jesus showed up. The religious custom was on the Sabbath day, they went to the synagogues. They've been studying the Bible, studying the Old Testament. They've been singing the Hallel. They've been having regular church services. And the church was dominated with demons. It was dominated with demons because there was no authority in the preaching. There was no authority in the teaching. So when Jesus shows up, there was a man who had been in that synagogue probably for weeks in the synagogue. He had an unclean spirit. He was controlled by demons, and he recognized what the people didn't recognize, that Jesus had authority, and Jesus had power, and Jesus was the Son of God. And so in verse 24, he says, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now let me tell you what would transform the church. <laughs> what would totally change the church of Jesus Christ in America 
and Jesus Christ and West Virginia and Charleston, if every member of the church would really understand who Jesus is, the Holy One of God, the one with the authority and with the power to bring about consequences and to deal with any situation or circumstance. So this demon possessed man and the demons inside of him said, we know who you are. Don't torment us. Don't torture us. We know that our ultimate destination is destruction, but don't do it before the time. And Jesus said, hush up. I don't need for you to give a testimony about me. Jesus did not want the demons to give testimony about his power. He wants the testimony to come from the redeemed, from those who've experienced his saving grace, who've experienced his mercy, whose name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. So he refused to allow the demons to bestow on him any accolade or praise. He said, you just hustle up your mouth. And so with authority, he delivers the demons. And when the unclean man had convulsed him and the guy went into convulsions and fits, he then cries out with a loud voice and he comes out. Jesus demonstrates his authority in preaching and calling and teaching and in deliverance. If the church is going to be authenticated, if it's going to be credentialed as a continuation of the life of Jesus of Nazareth, we got to demonstrate some authority. And not only must we demonstrate authority, excusia, we also must demonstrate some dunamis, dynamite, some power. So Jesus now not only demonstrates his authority, he demonstrates his power in that he commands the demons to come out of the man and they have to obey him. So every now and then, someone who comes to the Grace Bible Church ought to get saved and be able to give a testimony how God has saved them. Every now and then, somebody ought to stand up and be able to give a testimony of how God has delivered them from something. About how they've been able to overcome an addiction or, or a habit or a problem or a situation or a circumstance. Every now and then, somebody ought to testify not to how they're functioning underneath the circumstance, but how God has delivered them and put them on a high place above the situation or the circumstance. If the church is going to capture the imagination of an onlooking community, we must have some authority that is demonstrated in our preaching and in our teaching and demonstrating how we call people. I'm still looking for the first young person who to say in junior high school or high school, God has called me to the ministry. God has called me and then I'm going to give my years in junior high and in high school preparing myself for what it is that God has for me to do because I know that God has something for me to do. We need authority. We got to demonstrate some power because we're trying to convince people if you follow us, you're going to get to heaven. That's what we're saying. That's a bold an audacious proclamation to say to somebody that is dead in trespasses and sins, to say to someone that is wrapped up in addiction and dysfunction, to say to someone that is held hostage by their habits who know nothing but a generation and a genealogy of sin and dysfunction, and then you show up and say, follow me, and you can get to heaven. That's a bold claim. You got to have something to back that up. You got to have some authority and some power to back up that claim and back up that statement. And that's what Jesus relentlessly does through the Gospel of Mark, and that's what Mark records. Now, they're just getting started. They haven't got to Jerusalem yet, they're still in Nazareth of Galilee. And after this demonstration of authority and power and deliverance, verse 27 says, Then they were all amazed, they were stupefied. They were dumbfounded. They were totally perplexed. They didn't know what to say. They ain't never seen nothing like this in the church. Been coming to synagogue every single week all their lives. Nobody has been delivered. Nobody has talked about God's power to change them. And so they started coming out of ritual, routine, and road, and nobody expected nothing to happen. And so nothing did happen. And the Jesus shows up. Verse 27, they were all amazed. 
So they questioned among themselves, said, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and it obey him. And then a word that you see repeatedly over and over and over and over and over and over in Mark's gospel, exus, immediately. Mark said it was so fast, immediately, immediately, immediately. Mark uses gross spiritual hyperbole. Immediately it spread. What no internet? What no cyberspace? What no Facebook? What no tweet? But Mark said immediately the word got everywhere. He was so bad, so powerful, so authoritative, so genuine, so authentic, that when he did stuff, everybody started talking about it. And people were gossiping about it, and we showed up somewhere. His strain had already reached. It spread it throughout all the region around about Galilee. One church service, Mark said. And his fame had spread all over the region of the north of Galilee. Why I just stop by to tell you this morning is greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you got some authority. And you got some power. Let me close this by going way back in antiquity. Because the thread, the, the spirit of my good friend Glenn Walker just swelled up inside my mind. Glenn Walker is the worst storyteller I've ever heard. He can't get it out. He just can't get it all together. He's laughing before he gets to the end of the punchline. But there's one story I love to hear him tell. It's the story of the prairie chicken. The prairie chicken's down on the prairie. And the prairie chicken would see all the eagles soaring up in the sky. And the prairie chicken said, I wish I was an eagle. I wish I could fly like that. The prairie chicken looked at the rest of the prairie chicken, and he didn't look like the rest of the prairie chicken. He said, I wish I looked like the rest of the prairie chicken, and I wish that I could fly like an eagle and soar up in the sky. And one day, the prairie chicken got to running real fast, faster than he'd ever ran before. And as he was running, he tripped, and he fell off a ledge. He now started crying for his mama, and he started watching flapping his wings, and his utter amazement, rather than falling off the cliff and hitting the bottom, he started to fly, just like the eagles he had envied all of his life. What the prairie chicken didn't know, that when he was just a little eaglet, he had gotten knocked out of the nest, and his mama lost track of him. So a mama prairie chicken picked him up and cared for him like a prairie chicken. And in his mind, he thought he was a prairie chicken, but in his DNA, he was an eagle. And it took a crisis situation or circumstance for what the real DNA to come out of him and for him to realize that he was an eagle. Now, some of you, for all your life, you've been wandering around with your head down, looking up, saying, oh, I wish I could soar like an eagle. I wish I was like a bird and I could fly up in the sky above all of my situations, circumstances, but you've just been fum bumbling around and say, I'm just a lowly, lowly prairie chicken. And what you don't realize is in your spiritual DNA, you have the capacity to soar and do something great for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ if you would just tap into it. Now, if you don't tap into it on your own, God is going to bring a situation or a circumstance, a crisis, a challenge, or a test. To make it come up out of you. To prove to you and everybody around you that there's something on the inside of you that distinguishes you and that makes you special and there's something that only you can do. And God did not place you here simply because you are a cosmic accident. God placed you here on purpose. And so your preeminent ambition was to try to figure out why did God place me here. And don't ever settle for anything less than what God has for you. Don't let nobody talk you out of greatness if you believe God has called you to do something great. Don't, don't let it be your mama, your daddy, your brothers, or your sisters. You know when I get to heaven, I'm really through now because I'm 35 minutes. I owe y'all four minutes. When I get to heaven, after I spent about at least a thousand years with the Lord, 
stop by and see my mama, my grandmama, my brother, and my only son. I'm saying, Lord, can I get a furlough? I want to go see Joseph. I want to go see Joseph. And what I want to tell him, I said, Joseph, let me tell you, man. It would not have mattered what you would have done. You could have gave your brothers a coat. You could have went out and bought coats for all of them. They still would have sold you into slavery. Because of what was inside of them versus what was inside of you. And so you got to realize there's always going to be people close to you trying to talk you out of what you believe that God has called you to do. Trying to convince you you can't do it. It's not going to be people you don't know. It's going to be people that you know and people who think they know you. And they do know you. They just don't know what's inside of you. No one knows what God has placed on the inside of another person. No one knows but God. And very often, we don't even know ourselves. We don't even know ourselves what God has placed inside of us and what God wants to birth in and through us. But I believe if we just keep trusting him and saying, Lord, what do you say do, I do. Wherever you say go, I'll go. It will amaze us what God might do in and through us. Amen? Amen. Don't settle for being a prairie chicken on the largest prairie farm on the planet if God called you to soar like an eagle, even a golden eagle. Let's pray together, shall we? <laughs> Father, we thank you for another glorious day you blessed us to see. Thank you.